This is Alice. I found a story that I wrote when I was only in my teens, maybe 16 years old, about an adventure I had with my father and my uncle at a place in the country. And I thought I would read it to you now because it's written in cursive. And so it's indecipherable for many people these days. So the story goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a great house in the country. The house was separated from the public road by a narrow stretch of woods sheltering a stream. The dirt road that led from the public road to the house skimmed along the near side of the woods for some distance as if it were reluctant to offer the public a view, plunged into the woods and ascended a gentle slope. The slope, at the top of which the house stood, bore several minor structures. At the bottom, a corn crib. Farther up, a tool shed. A barn all of worn wood with broken doors. At the top, and to the side of the house, a building recently used as servants' quarters, formerly a doctor's office. The house itself was surrounded by aged maples, elms, and oaks. The dirt road ended at the rear of the house, and the lawn in front was overgrown with weeds that left burrs and baker's lice on trespassers. The bushes along the sides of the lawn were scarcely recognizable without their leaves as cultivated plants gone to wild. The front door of the house, a massive wood paneled structure cast to shade by the porch roof, was locked. To the left of the main door was a two-story wing of the house with a smaller porch and door unlocked. Inside this door was a room that served as a kitchen. There was a large fireplace with a tiled hearth. Empty shelves lined the walls. A very old refrigerator held a half gallon preserve half full of large tough string beans. They were pickled. They smelled foul. A narrow stairway to the rear of the kitchen led to the servants' sleeping quarters. Two small, low-ceilinged rooms. Rubbish of all sorts covered the floor. Broken chairs and bed springs, magazines, liquor and soda bottles, old clothing, a child's doll. The planking and rafters of the roof formed the ceiling of the rooms. In the left room, the brick stack of the kitchen chimney protruded from the wall. The view from the windows gave onto the maples in front and the wall of the main house to rear. A door in the kitchen gave on a large high-ceilinged room in the main house. Heavy carved wood molding framed the doorways and a large shuttered window. Some of the floor planking had been removed so that one picked one's way carefully between black holes of undetermined depth into the room directly opposite. This was an enlarged hallway, giving on the main door and sheltering a wide banistered staircase. Under the staircase was a small closet with a wooden nail across, an old gray coat on a rusty coat hanger. Planks had been removed from the staircase at random making it necessary to climb on the skeletal form of the stairs. 
The second story landing was dimly lit by another large shuttered window to the right. Between the window glass and the shutter nestled a family of large gray bats. There were about 20, the largest about 8 inches long, the smallest babies 3 inches long, nestled close to their upside-down mothers. Most were sleeping quietly. A few punctuated their search for lice in their fur with the characteristic high-pitched squeak. Their wings were translucent gray in the light that filtered through the shutters. At close range, the delicate webbing of veins in the wings was visible. The two rooms on the second floor, opposite and to the right of the stairway, had no planking on the floor. The floor rafters stood bare over the wood lathe supporting the plaster ceiling of the parlor and hall below. The third floor, with identical but slightly lower ceilinged rooms, had almost intact floors. In the room opposite the stairwell, old clothes cluttered the floor. The remains of a bureau stood in one corner. The shutters from one of the two windows had come undone, and the room was well lit. The clothes in the room were of the last century. There were many faded dresses with floor-length skirts, voluminous folds of material. There was one pair of men's trousers with black and white striped suspenders. There were rolls of yellowing fancy lace two inches wide intended for embroidery of home-sewn dresses. In the room to the left of the stairs, piles of rubbish were scattered about. The only light came from the small window giving onto the roof of the servants' quarters. A trap door in the ceiling gave on a completely dark crawl space smelling of cedar. Groping revealed a few rough planks of lumber. The trash on the floor of the bedroom was different from that in the servants' quarters. The bottles here were hand-blown glass, clear glass medicine bottles labeled Kellum's Sure Cure for Indigestion and Dyspepsia, faint blue bottles John C. Baker and Company citrate of magnesia, hoods, sarsaparilla. Small clear glass bottles with ground glass stoppers. Dark green bottles without labels had tiny bubbles fused in the glass that sparkled before the light. No clothing in this room. Wooden and cardboard boxes filled with books published in the 18th century. A curious stack of almanacs printed on yellow paper like newspaper. Fashion magazines of the same kind of paper with sketchings of women in dresses that humped and flared, high hairdos, large ornate hats. Scattered about the floor were pages of stationery covered with carefully graceful handwriting. Among the letters was an envelope containing a stiff yellow postcard with a photograph of a man and woman on the front. The woman, dressed like the women in the magazines, was seated. The man stood beside her with one elbow on the chair shoulder, foot propped on a stool, so that his bent knee, on which the other hand rested, was raised to a level 
midway between the woman's hands, folded in her lap, and her bodice. The man's hair was clipped short and slicked down. The man's mouth wavered between a smile and indifference. The woman was smiling with her head tilted slightly to one side. The angle was accentuated by her broad-brimmed hat, whose white feathers curved into the margin of the picture. On the back of the postcard was the caption, Hilton and Mitchell Studios, South Carolina Avenue, Broadway, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Here is the letter I found on the bedroom floor. I'm going to change the names just a little bit to protect their identity. Greensboro, North Carolina, April 29th, 1865. My dear Violet, the long agony is over and the Confederacy is a failure. I am here with Johnston's army to be paroled and expect to leave for Maryland in the first day of May. We'll travel on horseback in company with a large number of ex-officers. Our route will be through Richmond, thence to Gordonsville, and on to the Potomac. We'll cross it opposite Poolsville in Montgomery County. If I meet with no unforeseen interruption, expect to reach home about the 20th. I will not now attempt a narrative of the painful and eventful scene of the closing days of our struggle. This will serve for many a long talk in brighter and happier days. Brad Johnston is here and may accompany me homeward. He has just informed me of a public meeting which was held in Cecil County, Maryland to protest against and prevent the return of Marylanders who have taken part in the rebellion. I hope the sentiments expressed by that meeting have but few advocates in the old state. Now, my dear Violet, do write me a long letter giving me all the news and informing me what I may expect from the people of the state, or rather, those who I must meet. I am prepared to meet any difficulty in an effort to be with you again. Only let me know that the effort meets your approbation. I will return to you with a heart unchanged and a love as ardent and sincere as when we last met. Thank God the privation and exposure incident to the life I have led for the last four years has made but little impression upon my health. Time has dealt gently and kindly with me, and indeed, I am happy in the hope of soon being able to redeem the promise long ago made you. Confiding so entirely in your constancy and affection, I am really sure that you will gladly welcome my return. The future is full of hope for me. Happy indeed will I be when I can devote my time in contributing to your pleasure and enjoyment. To make you happy will indeed be happiness for me. Now that the Union is restored, you can have no hesitation or difficulty in writing to me. As soon as I see home, I will seek you. Let me know where you will be. Can I be welcome at your home? Be sure to write me and enclose in envelope sent. I will expect you to do so. Please don't disappoint me. Remember me to your mother, your cousin, and all friends. 
Ever yours affectionately, C. A. Hastings. And as a postscript, perhaps I may not be able to leave here so soon as the first. In that event, I will not reach home as early as the 20th. I will write you again from Richmond. Be sure to write me and put it in an envelope directed to me. Then enclose it in the envelope I send you. By so doing, no one will know that you have written me. I guess these are the people, huh? Can you see it? 